In today's episode of Tristan Take Video, I'm doing performance testing with World Tour cycling coach, John Wakefield. John currently works with Team Bora Hansgrohe as a performance coach while simultaneously running the Science to Sport Lab here in Girona. In this episode, John is going to give me two different kinds of tests that you would see at the top level of the sport, testing my VO2, my lactate accumulation, and a couple of other things along the way. I'm gonna ask John some questions about my cycling performance and how they compare to World Tour pros, and also ask him some questions that can help you guys with your cycling performance as well. So before we go too far, I'm gonna grab my bike, I'm gonna roll over to Science to Sport and get into it. This is performance testing with World Tour cycling coach, John Wakefield. Let's do it. This is when things got very real for Tristan. Head up, head up, head up, head up, head up. Come on, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. There we go, that's come it. On. Come, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. And yeah, stop. stop. Head up, head up. <sighs> Alrighty, so we're back in the Science to Sport lab today here in the center of Girona. If you guys did watch my bike fit video with John a few weeks ago, you will have seen all about the Science to Sport lab. But today we're doing performance testing and John's gonna do some testing to find out how good a cyclist I actually am. We threatened to do this in the last video and now we're doing it for real. <laughs> I've got to say I'm more nervous today for this test than I've been for probably any race for the last few years now. That's because numbers don't lie and we're gonna find out just how good or bad I am. Tell me, what have you got on the cards for me today? You said we're doing three tests in two tests. Can you explain what those tests are? Yeah, so surprise he's come back, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so today we're gonna to do a full metabolic profile in VO2. So as Tristan had said, it's three tests in, in uh, two tests. The first test comprises of two, so it's, it's fat max so to see his maximal fat oxidization rate and then additionally to that we'll do lactate accumulation which is to see where his body accumulates enough lactate that uh, his body doesn't metabolize it anymore so then he gets a short break and then the second test that we do is a peak power in a vo2 test which is the traditional ram test um, and that will give us his peak power it'll give us his vo2 value and it'll also give us um, as a company we use five training zones and that'll give us uh, his five training zones going forward. For you guys at home, just to let you know, I haven't discussed it yet, but John is now coaching me after I had that bike fit. John's become my coach, so I've got a decent World Tour coach behind me. <laughs> so although I haven't done any real testing with John that I'm gonna tell you guys about right now, there is some testing going on. We're doing sort of ongoing checks of my power and things like that. But today is the main one to set some training zones. Yeah. Obviously working with professional cyclists all the time with Bora, you've got some literal race winners who have won this past week in Ida Schilling and uh, Lenny Kamner. You do this kind of testing with those guys as well. Is this the kind of testing you would do with World Tour riders to see where they're at at the start of the season or to see whether they're good enough to get a contract? Tell me about this kind of testing for, for professional cyclists. Yeah, so basically you answer both of them. We do do or have done testing on athletes should they want to come onto a team and we do a full, sort of full metabolic test on them to see where they are and couple that with their power data and also their race results and then also for pre-season testing at training camps and that maybe a little bit of the methodology changes but you basically do a general overview of a test that is uh, very similar to what so well, basically exactly the same as what Tristan is doing. So these are important tests to really yeah. establish a baseline for riders. Correct. Um, and then for people at home if they were looking at having this kind of testing done on themselves they can come in here and obviously have this test done with yeah. you and then obviously if you wanted to have John or Science to Sport coach you you can have that as well but for any level of coaching it's really good to have those baselines set yeah. Yeah correct you know you don't have to specifically do this whole battery of testing you can do as an example fat max and lactate accumulation or just the PPO test and you can get really valuable data but essentially if you do this full fat screening you can get everything. So John and I were just talking off camera just before about the fact that we're doing a VO2 test today now I'm super nervous about the VO2 test everyone kind of knows the VO2 test to be like a brutal one because you go to exhaustion you go until you can't go anymore but you just said before that you don't think that uh, VO2 is now a measure of a cyclist performance as much as 
versus other metrics. Why is that? Yeah, just science has changed. So while you, you obviously an athlete has to have, have a good VO2 value, it, it's not the holy grail anymore of what it was sort of in the 80s and early 90s in terms of a performance predictor. You know, if you look at an athlete, if they are more metabolically efficient or the economy is really good, any top athlete will have a good VO2, but you don't have to have now a, a VO2 of say 90 to, to win the tour anymore. You, you've seen guys win with, with less. And that's because the trading is changing. Yeah, changing is technology on bikes and equipment has changed. The way the races yeah. are being raced maybe. Yeah, it's like junior races now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in fairness. Yeah. So, well, it is kids that are racing anyway. Yeah. You look at the age demographic, but uh, yeah, it, sort of science has changed. So with that, obviously, uh, an athlete's profile changes at the same time. So that was something I didn't expect to have happen. John was just taking my skin <laughs> folds to see my body fat percentage. Can you just explain what you found? Surprising, he's pretty lean, I will say. Um, no faith in me. Yeah, no, there's some faith growing now, but since our cleat issue, there wasn't a lot of faith in Tristan. So, but yeah, he's lean. He's come out at just over 6%, six and a half percent. Yeah, it's good, um, especially if you categorize him as sort of a age grouper in terms of age. <laughs> um, but yeah. Oh, it's, it's it's good you know typically you see guys you know you would see sort of your elite level athletes on that sort of uh, five five and a half percent six percent okay. so he does carry a bit more muscle mass than um, you know sort of Walter or that sort of pro conti level rider as a as a road rider, but he's yeah he's good. That's and by the way, I've since replaced both my cleats and my insoles. <laughs> Big shout out to Bont for delivering me some new insoles. They just arrived yesterday. There's a discount code for Bont. Everything at Bont if you want in the description down there. But yeah, big thanks to Bont for my new insoles there. Cool. All right, let's get let's into get you on the bike. actual testing. Woofed. Alrighty. So, <laughs> done with the first test. That was a warm up. That was the warm up, <laughs> uh, the old lactate threshold test. So, to explain that test, or maybe John can explain that test, basically that's how many watts was it per minutes or? Yeah, so it's um, seven minute steps and we started at 160 watts and it was 25 watt jump every step. So at, at the end of every seven minutes, he went up 25 watts. So it was about a 45 minute test in the end, which you said that at the start and I was like, wow, that's a long test, but actually it did go by pretty quick. I was trying to like stay quite calm and keep my heart rate low, but you were saying heart rate is not really necessarily a measure of, it's got not too much to do with lactate threshold or? Um, yeah, so obviously everything correlates, but with him being indoors, we, we keep it at a controlled temperature of 70 degrees Celsius and he does have a fan on him at the same time but when you're outside you have that atmospheric cooling so you know if you're riding your bike you have the wind in your face and, and all the rest of it so your body as a as a core temperature is typically lower so your heart rate you know isn't really affected as much but where Tristan was saying to me is he was trying to focus really on keeping his heart rate down where that really wasn't the objective here like with heart rate being sort of as subjective as what it is there are many factors and variables that influence it so if you came in here super fatigued you know he would have a, a low heart rate because he wouldn't be able to elevate it as as the uh, power and stuff increases or if he was super fresh on the opposite end he may have an elevated heart rate because he was so fresh so while it is important again it's not the the uh, holy grail of, of the one metric that that we're looking for here okay awesome so then in terms of at the end of the test i was giving those sort of rankings out of like a, a rate of perceived exertion on the yes. car there it got a bit harder at the end 
And what did you find at the end of the test when you said, okay, enough is enough, like you've done, what was the reason for that? And then what did you find as a result? Yeah, so we stop it when the, op should the, the athlete sort of judge that RP scale correctly, we typically stop at around 16, 14, 16, depending on where they are, and also at a certain lactate value. So what Tristan had stopped at was four millimole, uh, which, and he had reported an, an RP of 15. So for us and the way that curve had gone, it was, it was accurately scored and, and the lactate had sort of accompanied his scoring and, and his elevation in heart rate. So we had stopped the test correctly. At the same time, what I had found was he's pretty metabolically efficient, um, but as soon as he gets into sort of the more higher intensities is when his, um, his body's not too happy about it. <laughs> so his, uh, his lactate curve essentially, instead of being almost like a little bit of a, a quarter pipe, if you skateboard, it literally went straight and then vertically up into a wall. So he's uh, got a bit of work to do in terms of his uh, accumulation work and, and lactate. So four millimole at around 300 watts yep. or so. And then just to put me on a scale of like, age grouper as you said before versus <laughs> world tour pro what generally is say a, a top top level athlete looking at and what is say someone who just rides a couple of days a week looking at in terms of that millimole around their threshold so obviously it works on watts per kilo as opposed to a certain value of, of power so you know tristan being when we weighed him now he was 63 although we complained my scale was out <laughs> um and if you take the 300 watts there um if you do that as a calculation at world tour um him Tristan being on four millimole, they typically be close to about one and a half, two, even less, depending on, on, on the athlete. And in terms of age- One group, and a half, two millimole for yeah. that kind of power to weight. Yeah, for that power to weight. I've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and with regards to an age grouper, he's yeah, he's good. Like he's um, yeah, you know, you're actually right there. It's okay. it's impressive. So I'm not like world tour pro, probably Almost. not even pro conti pro. No. Maybe I'm like domestic of a continental unpaid team pro. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's a little better than that. But in terms of you know, if you classify him really in terms of age group and stuff, he was good. So John's actually not very impressed with me as an athlete, unfortunately. But <laughs> it's. Something we can work on I want to ask you uh, you just told me a couple of the numbers of some professionals that you've worked with obviously really really good numbers my numbers are not quite there which to be honest is a bit disappointing for me because everyone wants to hear that they're a very good athlete especially because I train a lot do you think that given where I'm at that I can I can definitely get some improvement by change my training or, or... yeah definitely um, especially when you see sort of how is how is sort of lactate curve developed over the period of the test you always want to move essentially that curve as much to the right as possible. As I said, when you look at his, there's definitely room for improvement. So to improve that, you can't really say, oh, you'll find five, 10, 15, 20% worth of improvement. It's physically almost impossible to say that, but you can definitely, by doing a focused block of training in and around this, you can definitely improve um, and just get your body to metabolize lactate a lot better. And you'll already feel an improvement and all your numbers will improve throughout the range. And yep. what would you say is a quick example of a session that I would need to work on is that it's working at vo2 and lactate threshold um it would at first probably be just below that so you would work at that infliction point um in and around that infliction point of where your lactate started to have that accumulation where you couldn't metabolize it so riding at the watts where the where yeah it correct okay. so hypothetically if it was 300 watts depending on the duration but you want a longer duration so anything from 20 minutes up to even two hours in, in terms of the duration you'd want to work at sort of two 90, 310 in terms of watts if our big accumulation point was at uh, 300 watts. Okay, yeah. yeah, cool. Alrighty, sweet. So that is the first test out of the way. That one was apparently not the difficult one. So we're about to jump into the difficult one. Can you please explain yeah. what is the difficult one and what are we hoping to see? Sure, so this one's a lot shorter. It's your typical, what people understand is your ramp test. Uh, it starts at 100 watts and it increases 20 watts every minute or one watt every three seconds. So it's not like you're going from minute one to two and it jumps 20, 20, 20. It's a gradual sort of slope upwards. And what that is going to tell us is it'll give us his peak power. It'll give us his crossover point where his body stops using fats and use carbohydrates as a fuel source. It'll also give us peak heart rate, our heart rate zones, our power zones, and your peak power. 
And VO2. And VO2. That's and right. VO2, because it's interesting. Like, I haven't had a... I had, I've had one VO2 test in my life. Okay. But it was, like, 11 years ago. And I probably okay. rocked up and I was hung over or something like that. So, More than likely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I'm interested to know about the VO2. But as we sure. said at the start cool. there, VO2 is not everything. Yeah. So, there's a lot of metrics going on in this test. And you Correct. said to me before, you reckon this test is about 12 minutes or so? Uh, I, I've predicted about 15 minutes for you. <laughs> so, I've, I've put some money on the bag did that yeah? change? Did that change after seeing the yeah, first test? after seeing this i've changed it so I've, I've gone to the bookies with about 15 minutes so it's it's up to you to go longer than 15 minutes okay aiming for yeah. longer than 15 minutes yeah and how many watts do you are we thinking what does 15 minutes give you I'll do the math one one so 10 one minutes. watt every three seconds yeah so no what 20 20 watts every minute so 10 minutes is 300 so 15 i want minutes you is... around like I'd like you around 410, 420. Whoa. Around there. That's a lot of watts. It's a lot of watts. All right. right. It's a phone number. Yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. See how cool. we go. So I've got one little, uh, my secret ingredient here. I recommend everyone do this if they're racing or doing any kind of testing. You can buy these things from the pharmacy for about five bucks for 10. It keeps your nostrils open. It's designed for sleeping, but hopefully this adds 10 watts. Let's see. Oh, I can breathe now. <laughs> So second test done, that was a lot shorter, only a third of the length, but a lot more brutal towards the end as you would have seen in that footage. Good to have you guys pushing me on. Can you just uh, explain to these guys at home, again, maybe start with what the purpose of that test was, but more so how you saw me go in terms of the numbers and the time and the power sure. and things like that. I lost money to begin with. On, uh, he definitely uh, used my money as a motivation to go to go further than where it was, which what, is great. You estimated 15 minutes. Yeah, I estimated 15, 15 and a half is where I was expecting him to, to kind of pull the plug. And he went uh, significantly over to, to 17 minutes odd. So um, 
10 out of 10. Like m motivations I'll a take that thing. money now, please. Yep, that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> lay by. But yeah, so basically just to correlate, what we wanted to do was find out obviously uh, Tristan's VO2 value. We wanted to find out his peak power value, which was obviously at the end of the test. In between all of that, we wanted to get his threshold. We wanted to get uh, his crossover point where his body stops using fats and uses carbohydrates as a fuel source. And with that, we'll obviously identify his um, specific training zones. And then in terms of like, it's very easy to do these sorts of tests and be like numbers mean everything. This is an, in this is an indicator of whether I could be amateur level, continental, pro conti, world tour. But these things are not always, I mean, numbers are very important. They are a starting point. They're sure. a very good indicator of performance, but there are other elements to being a bike rider and that's bike handling, reading a race if you're a racer. Yeah, sure. Um, things like that. Do you have any examples of any riders who you've been like, wow, their numbers are uh, not bad, but they're not at the level of the rider that they're actually riding at. Yeah, I worked with a, uh, he was actually a very close friend of mine. I worked with a, a guy back in South Africa who went on to race world tour and stuff. And on paper, he should never have raced there. It was, it was a fact. Like his numbers were good. They weren't spectacular in that, but yet he went on to have incredible race results. Won some races, got good exposure and everything. And that was purely because Monday to Friday, we focus a lot on the science of, of what he needed to do. But then come Saturday, and Sunday when he needed to race, it was purely just instinct. And I still say it, as I said to you earlier, like to this day, he's probably one of the best people I believe that can actually read a race and, and know how to race a bike. Yes, numbers are super important. You know, you can't push my numbers and expect to have great bike tactical skills and race at a high level, that's just not gonna happen. But at the same time, it's not the holy grail or end or be all where we also test people and we're like, oh, this guy should be winning grand tours and he really struggles. You know, so it's not, um, it's important, but there's more to it than just what you produce on, on, a, on a power meter. And then just got two more little questions for you. For me, I ended at about 430 watts or so. Yep. We've worked that out to be about 6.8 watts a kilo was my yep. maximal power. Which is really good. You're, you're happy with that? Yeah, yeah, actually pretty impressed. I lost money on that. <laughs> very good. <laughs> what might a, a very good world tour rider be hitting? And also what might someone at home who's riding two to three days a week doing a little bit of training hope to, to get if they do a test like this? World tour from that peak power value, you're looking at sort of from seven and a half, what's seven, seven and a half, what's a kilo? Sort of upper echelon of that. And then, yeah, someone at home, it's, it's relatively, it's a wide spectrum, but anything, you know, if for a really undertrained person that's beginning, maybe three and a half, four watts a kilo and up to where you land up, you yeah, know, cool. just running a bit more than, than three days a week. So from that sort of demographic, it, it does vary depending on, on where they are, how they are, etc. So it's all very individualized. And then one last question I have for you. Can you explain the difference between say an indoor test, which I hate because I just feel like I can't ride the trainer at all. Really I never practice it. it. <laughs> uh, to, to riding outdoors where we all sure. aspire to ride and, uh, yeah. and want to use the trainer training that we either do indoors or outdoors. Yeah. What is the difference there? Obviously now with integration of, of indoor trainers and stuff a lot in people's training and that, that gap between outdoors and indoors is a lot closer. Typically we often see obviously high numbers outdoors because people aren't really accustomed to riding indoors, but you can see sometimes a variance of about 10% yeah. if they really do not like indoor trainers and stuff, or they just do not like testing in this manner. Some people are kind of can, cannot test. Simple as that. 10% outdoors. Yeah. Correct. Wow, okay, so this it's, it's not gonna happen, Chris. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's good to know. It's something yeah. to work with. <laughs> All righty, so now uh, I've just got changed. I just want to say before we go any further, thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me. Like the bike fit, it took a lot longer than planned. Uh, that's what happens when you film a vlog along the way. For people at home, if they are interested in doing this kind of testing with Science to Sport, you offer this around the world. Can you just explain where they can get it done? Um, um, and a couple of other details. Yeah, so obviously, Girona, we where Tristan is. In South Africa, we have a performance center where, where we manage and work from. And then we obviously have different partners around. So if you have hypothetically Australia, Italy, etc., let us know and, and we can direct you on, 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 on the right way. I did have a couple of questions actually from people yeah. in the bike fit video and they were wondering about price. The reason the pricing is not on Science to Sport website is because you have all these services around the world and it varies, yeah. Yeah, yeah correct. Like as an example, what is charged 
as the norm in America, we go out of business here. No one would come to us. So, you know, prices do vary on location. So what you're yeah. saying is you can come to Girona from America, have a holiday, do your testing and fly home again Smart and you probably will have saved money. Yeah, which some guys had actually done from your bike but video, <laughs> believe it or not. So yes, it's, it's actually worth worthwhile. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Once again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, if you want to see any of the details of Science of Sport, from bike fitting to rider testing, even coaching from John or from other Science to Sport professionals, jump down to the link in the description. Have a look. And uh, as always, we'll say, give this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. We'll see you all in the next video very soon. All cheers, right. cheers. Adieu. Thanks.